Yoshi here with another entry of The Gulag. In this video, I'll be reviewing the long-awaited Beetlejuice sequel titled, uh, Beetlejuice Beetlejuice, starring Michael Keaton and directed by Tim Burton, the two collaborating again for the first time in 32 years. If you don't count Dumbo. I certainly don't count Dumbo. Who watched Dumbo? I definitely didn't. What the f***? I'm joined in my Beetlejuice Beetlejuice review by my creator and best friend, Dr. Wolfula. I'm not your f***ing best friend. You told me before we started to introduce you as my best friend. That was just so I could set you up for this embarrassing moment, Goulash. You should feel embarrassed. Well, it worked then. Good, you f***ing loser. Okay, take it easy. Since the success of Beetlejuice in 1988, there have been multiple failed attempts at a Beetlejuice sequel over the years. The most notorious and long-running attempt was Beetlejuice Goes Hawaii which would have seen the ghost with the most following the Dietz family to the tropics where he would have entered a surf competition. Wait, you're saying we could have had a Hawaiian-themed Beetlejuice sequel? Well, it seemed like it was just Tim Burton f***ing around requesting the most ridiculous premise for a Beetlejuice sequel so he wouldn't have to make a sequel. Ridiculous? What the hell are you talking about? Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian sounds incredible! Well, Tim Burton has always been hesitant to direct sequels. The only other sequel before this newest Beetlejuice was Batman Returns, and Burton only agreed to helm that if he could have a lot more creative control, which led to making a very dark, weird sequel that, while good, was far less kid-friendly and made Burton directing any sequels in the future unlikely. Just the pussy I've been looking for. And the sequels that did need his involvement would be sent into development hell so Burton could make new and exciting movies. Like Planet of the Apes and Willy Wonka remakes? Well, his career took a dive in the 2000s, but Corpse Bride was good. I guess. And so was Big Fish. Oh, shut the f Big Fish suck. It was a good movie. No, it wasn't. It was sappy, over-sentimental dog sh and if you told me Spielberg directed it, I would believe you. Let's just get to this Beetlejuice Beetlejuice review before I just f***ing murder you. Okay, well, after Tim Burton suffered career burnout in the 2010s, he of course bounced back, directing the Wednesday series on Netflix, which made Burton in demand to direct another movie, and a Beetlejuice sequel in some form had been in development up until 2019 just waiting for Tim Burton to finally commit to it. And despite his hesitation to be involved in a Beetlejuice sequel, it really does make sense as his next logical career move. Taking things back to the beginning of his career, reminding people what about Burton's sensibilities as a director that they like to begin with, with a project that is inherently honed into his style, that has a built-in audience as a familiar property that can hopefully get Tim Burton's name out there again as a weird, spooky filmmaker, and not the guy who will direct a live action Dumbo movie for Disney. What the f***? But does Beetlejuice Beetlejuice manage to transcend its familiar trappings and be a good sequel? I'll break it down in my review. But first, I have a message from my sponsor. Me! Pledge to the Dr. Wolfula Patreon today to support the Dr. Wolfula and Gulag channels. Help them continue to grow and you'll also get access to weekly movie nights every Sunday. And archive commentaries if you miss the movie nights live. Just five bucks a month to get a movie night every week. Pledge to Patreon.com slash Dr. Wolfula if you're interested in my bonus movie night live streams and I thank you in advance. Is this a figment of your imagination? Beetlejuice Beetlejuice picks up right after the events of the first film. 36 years later. Yes, it's been half a lifetime since the first Beetlejuice came out. What? Why? 36 years is like five seconds to me. In that span of time, Lydia Dietz, played again by Winona Ryder, has grown up and has predictably become a burnout. And a burnout who grips her ability to see ghosts by hosting a popular supernatural talk show called Ghost House, which is a rearrangement of the generic title Warner Brothers wanted the original Beetlejuice to have, House Ghosts. House Ghosts is a sick title. You know what you're getting. Yes, well, uh, the first act of the Beetlejuice sequel is pretty f***ing weird. I didn't really see Lydia as TV talk show host material. She seemed to be really into photography in that first movie and didn't seem so extroverted to host her own TV show. It felt like the writers were mainly leaning on her Haley Joel Osment powers gimmick, figuring out who she would be today, and not on who she would be today based on who she was as a person since we last saw her. Living, the dead, can they coexist? 
Lydia instead, disappointingly, becomes much like her stepmother Delia, the very person she despised the most in the first film. One of those fake people who uses any ounce of ability they have to grift, and who are a wreck in their interior life, popping pills straight from a trash can. A total burnout! Beetlejuice Beetlejuice has a very depressing vision for Lydia Dietz as an adult, but that's become the standard approach with these legacy sequels. The characters you liked as a kid have gotten older and just totally suck now. Nobody ever seems to be happy with this approach, but it's become the norm for whatever reason. Be warned, it's intense. Turning Lydia into a mess and a trashy TV personality doesn't ruin the sequel, but it is a bit of a dark shadow over the movie. Not as bad as Tim Burton's last dark shadow, though. That movie really f***ing sucked. Yes, it did. Speaking of which, things suck even more for Lydia because she's a widower. She has a daughter who resents her named Astrid, played by Jenna Ortega, who's going to be playing teenage characters until she's cashing her social security checks. We'll see who gets the last laugh. And the resentment that Astrid feels towards Lydia only grows as Lydia becomes closer to her manager slash boyfriend, the ultra sleazy, exploitative, pretentious Rory, played by Justin Theroux, who tries to hijack Lydia's father's funeral by pressuring Lydia into marrying Rory two days later on Halloween. Oh, dear. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, they killed off Jeffrey Jones' Charles Dietz character because Jeffrey Jones was caught taking pictures of naked boys nine times. Nine times? Nine times. Despite Jeffrey Jones' lack of participation in the sequel, Charles Dietz appears throughout the film in a variety of ways. We see his death depicted in a stop-motion flashback where his plane crashes and he gets eaten by a shark and Charles enters the afterlife, gorily missing the top half of his body. But Charles somehow still has a voice despite not having a head and is voiced by a sound-alike as he tries to navigate the hereafter. It's a funny but strange handling of the Jeffrey Jones character. Sometimes it feels like a f you to Jeffrey Jones seeing his brutal death and having him be a headless corpse for the rest of the movie, but the characters at the same time are upset by Charles' passing and are reverent towards him throughout the film. Having a choir sing a sad version of Deo at Charles' funeral with a photo of Jeffrey Jones on Charles' shark fin shaped tombstone. I can't believe Grandpa is dead. Death is hard. It makes it feel like Jeffrey Jones really did die, and they desperately wanted to still have him play some role in the new film. But he's still alive. His career is just dead for being a creep. Dad! <laughs> We didn't really need much Charles Dietz beyond seeing his funny death and seeing his headless ghost at the end of the movie as a sight gag. Beetlejuice Beetlejuice goes to great lengths to explain what became of Charles Dietz, but all it says happened to the Maitland ghosts, who were really the main characters of the original film, is that they found a loophole to enter the great beyond, but it seemed like their ideal afterlife was working on their home forever. Obviously, Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis have aged, which ghosts don't necessarily do, and the whole involuntary manslaughter thing on Baldwin's part, but they maybe could have gotten around these things by making the Maitland ghosts a subtle presence in the house. Or that they're on vacation on one of Saturn's moons or something. Just something better than that Casper ghost can go to heaven bullshit the movie implies. Where do sandworms on Titan fit into Christian theology? I don't know. What I do know is that Lydia has been seeing visions of Beetlejuice, played again by Michael Keaton, in her daily life, which seems like Beetlejuice has been hatching some kind of scheme to enter the mortal world again. But not really. Beetlejuice in the years since has been running an afterlife call center where all of his employees are shrunken head guys for some reason. Yeah, just see him concentrating here. The shrunken head guys feel like taking a small but memorable thing from the first movie and making it a much bigger deal in the sequel. The shrunken head guys in Beetlejuice Beetlejuice almost feel like this movie's answer to the minions doing wacky cute in the background like the mini Stay Puffed Marshmallow Men in the recent Ghostbusters movies. You must admit they are highly marketable, sir. I can't argue with that. Bob, you and the boys stand guard. Nobody gets through. Beetlejuice's and Lydia's stories are pretty separate until the second half of the film. Beetlejuice's whole thing is that his ex-wife and life Dolores, played by Monica Bellucci, has reassembled herself after Beetlejuice cut her up into a bunch of pieces after she poisoned him first. Women can't live with them, so you have to brutally murder them. I don't think that's the saying, sir. Well, that's the version I live and kill by. Fair enough. The Dolores subplot feels like such an afterthought. Tim Burton's dating Monica Bellucci 
Gucci now, so it feels like she's the new Lisa Marie or Helena Bonham Carter. Whoever Tim Burton is currently f***ing needs to appear in every one of his movies. So wait, does that mean Tim Burton was f***ing Johnny Depp? Most likely. Dolores just kind of pops up in a scene with Danny DeVito cameoing as a janitor in the afterlife, which also feels like Danny DeVito had a day free from shooting Always Sunny, so they made up a role he could do real quick as a favor to Tim Burton. Just the pussy I've been looking for. Dolores' scene putting herself back together is pretty cool, but it's a bit jarring. It comes out of nowhere and goes for quite a while, making it seem like her character could be a bigger deal than she actually was, having the ability to suck souls. And in this case, soul sucker is not a euphemism for somebody who's good at sucking dick. Dolores can suck out the souls of the undead, which somehow kills them, I guess. She's a soul sucker. Yeah, you can say that again. And Dolores is out for revenge against Beetlejuice, or wants to marry him again. I don't really know. Beetlejuice! What the f***? It seems like Dolores will be the main villainess, but she's just sort of off to the side sucking souls until eventually she catches up with Beetlejuice in the final act. Beetlejuice! What the f***? Dolores is only really an unnecessary added motivation for Beetlejuice to try to get back to the mortal world. You just got away from her permanently. You want me to marry? I thought you'd never ask. This is somewhat mirrored by the Astrid plot of the film. By random coincidence, Astrid rides a bike and crashes into a boy named Jeremy's backyard, and it's very obvious just from how unassuming and normal Jeremy is that he's totally a ghost. Is your mom Lydia Dietz? Unfortunately. She's a legend. Beetlejuice Beetlejuice coincidentally has a very similar subplot to Phoebe's in Ghostbusters Frozen Empire earlier this year, where Astrid has a romance with somebody who turns out to be a ghost. In Frozen Empire, it was an ambiguous romantic relationship out of fear of not being able to sell the movie in countries where gay relationships, even with ghosts, are outlawed. But in Beetlejuice Beetlejuice, since it's a hetero teen ghost romance, they can be more open with it. I can accept a ghost romance, but a gay ghost romance? Miss me with that. Sir, you're gonna make it really difficult for me to get a silver play button saying things like that. Good, if I can't get a silver play button, I definitely don't want your loser channel to get one. All right, let's just settle down here. Oh, and good luck getting a silver play button making two or three videos a year. Great work ethic, jackass. Okay, whatever. Like with the teen love story in Frozen Empire, very obviously there's a double cross at the end of it. But while Frozen Empire tried to make its ghost girl a sympathetic pyro specter who selfish almost dooms humanity to eye-rolling results, Beetlejuice Beetlejuice's Jeremy is just revealed to be a psychopathic killer who murdered his family and tries to trade Astrid's soul for his so Jeremy can return to the mortal world. So like with Dolores, it seems then that Jeremy's the main villain. But no, he's just a minor obstacle that sets the characters off on their path with Lydia striking a deal to have the ghost with the most help Lydia find Astrid in the afterlife. But how do I know that you're going to keep your word? I swear on my dead mother's soul. Beetlejuice Beetlejuice is overstuffed to the brim with ideas that just don't feel fully realized. It feels like they put all of their ideas for a sequel minus Going Hawaiian together into one mega sequel. But it does make for a fast-paced, overwhelming watch. The narrative just isn't focused. Really? The original Beetlejuice had a more focused central narrative that was easier to follow while giving all the characters room to breathe and have their moments without feeling rushed along. You have a ghost couple that just wants to get rid of the new family in their house, so they explore all kinds of different options until Beetlejuice emerges as the main threat. In Beetlejuice Beetlejuice, it just feels like they give a subplot to every single character in the movie. Recognize this post servicing that chip for my life or afterlife. Willem Dafoe plays an afterlife cop named Wolf Jackson, who's amusing as this former action movie star who did his own stunts until it killed him. And Jackson gets a ton of screen time, but he doesn't actually have any real impact on the narrative beyond providing Beetlejuice with some exposition. But with the amount of screen time, it seems like Willem Dafoe would play a much more significant character, but he doesn't. What really is the central narrative of Beetlejuice Beetlejuice is hard to say. It suffers a bit from the problem a lot of these big budget sequels deal with, having unfocused narratives cluttered with unnecessary subplots and characters and front-loaded with exposition to the point where it's difficult to 
to say what the movie even was. It would have been cool if they just focused entirely on an adventure with Lydia and Beetlejuice in the afterlife trying to save Lydia's daughter. But it's not really that. That's more of a detour in the plot, and it isn't really about Beetlejuice's ex seeking revenge. You could cut her out completely, and it wouldn't change the movie much at all. What the f***? Beetlejuice Beetlejuice ultimately culminates in Beetlejuice forcing Lydia to marry him like in the original film, but this time Lydia is at least of legal age, which doesn't excuse the forced marriage, but at least that's something. The wedding scene in the sequel is a much more elaborate sequence than what was seen in the original film, but it ultimately plays out exactly the same way as the climax of the first movie, with Beetlejuice trying to marry Lydia just with a slight twist. I don't know why he needs to marry Lydia specifically. I guess maybe it's implied he does actually really love Lydia. Which is somehow even creepier considering in the years since, Beetlejuice keeps a photo of Lydia when she was 16. The movie's epilogue is also very strange, though. It ends on a downbeat, ambiguous note that seems to imply that maybe the entire movie was just a dream. Yeah, they ended a Beetlejuice sequel like it was an episode of Dallas. F***ing weird. Obviously, the biggest weakness of Beetlejuice Beetlejuice is its script. It's an amusing series of events, but it doesn't feel like there's a strong central premise or theme tying it all together. It feels like a very loose jumble of events that eventually gets tied up in the end. The writers of Beetlejuice 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 were also the showrunners of TV shows like Smallville and Tim Burton's Wednesday. And the weaknesses of the Beetlejuice Beetlejuice script make sense in that context. Beetlejuice Beetlejuice feels like a season of a live-action Beetlejuice TV show that they had to condense down to 100 minutes. It's filled with sprawling characters and plot threads that TV shows really thrive on nowadays, seeding things that can leave options for potential storylines in the future open. This open-ended approach works well for the sake of writing 100 hours of TV and making it easier for yourself, but when you're writing 100 minutes of movie, it can make the experience feel a little hollow. Weaknesses of the script aside, though, Beetlejuice Beetlejuice is ultimately a good sequel thanks to its stellar cast and direction by Tim Burton. The Beetlejuice sequel is Burton firing on all cylinders again, delivering a spooky showcase of his unique visual prowess. Beetlejuice Beetlejuice visually is the first Beetlejuice on steroids. <laughs> We get a larger view of the afterlife that's realized in beautifully slanted detail and filled with colorfully disfigured ghosts. Most of the effects are practical, some look kind of janky, but this adds to the charm of making the film feel more DIY, like a personal project when it really is a highly anticipated sequel with a $100 million budget. I swear the afterlife is so random. Guilty as charged. The visuals can be a little too over the top in some areas, but you're ultimately getting a pure, unfiltered Tim Burton movie with Beetlejuice Beetlejuice. Danny Elfman's score for the film is solid and experimental, but it feels a little overproduced compared to the original film score. It almost feels like a parody of Danny Elfman's style as a composer, or like someone trying to imitate Danny Elfman. The score isn't great, but it isn't the worst thing Danny Elfman has ever done. That's for sure. I love little girls, they make me feel so good. Back to the cast, it's great overall. There are some weak links, but I feel like that ultimately has to do with the script not being able to do justice to everyone in the massive cast. But ultimately, Winona Ryder does breathe some flawed humanity into the Lydia role. Catherine O'Hara often steals the show with some pretty funny moments as Delia. <sighs> Justin Thoreau plays into his role as a shitty, exploitative boyfriend well. He's very easy to hate, and ultimately, it's pure delight to see Michael Keaton reprise the role of Beetlejuice 36 years later. After all this time, he can make the character feel fresh, which is ironic because he's a dead guy. Beetlejuice. <laughs> Keaton's an even slimier Beetlejuice who has an I don't give a f mentality about him that makes him really stand out as a character today. I sense there's an enabler here, but we'll get to that. One thing that is iffy about the approach to Beetlejuice this time around is a lot of gags have Michael Keaton being dubbed over by a foreign voiceover or song. The first or second time this happens is funny, but it honestly would have been funnier hearing Michael Keaton doing these voices himself. Singing right here waiting in the Beetlejuice voice, for instance, instead of lip singing it. 
Beetlejuice Beetlejuice is filled with a lot of questionable choices and overstuffed with ideas that don't feel fully realized, and with some rehashes from the first film. But it's ultimately a fun sequel, revisiting the characters whose actors haven't been cancelled, and seeing an unfiltered Tim Burton expressing himself visually with some fantastic practical effects, and it's just nice to be able to see Michael Keaton play the ghost with the most one more time. I give Beetlejuice Beetlejuice three and a half shrunken heads out of five. What's your score, sir? I give Beetlejuice Beetlejuice a Jeffrey Jones mugshot out of Jeffrey Jones' funeral. Oh, dude. So, Goulash, do you think there'll be a third Beetlejuice movie? Whether or not there will be a Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice is up in the air. This new sequel seems like it's going to be a hit, but Tim Burton doubts he'll make another Beetlejuice himself, at least, considering this newest one took 36 years to happen. Well, what's next for Tim Burton, then? A remake of Attack of the 50-Foot Woman. The future is looking bright for Tim Burton. Beetlejuice! What the f***? Oh yeah, before I go, I'll also be reviewing the classic animated Beetlejuice series soon, so keep an eye out for that video. This video is made possible through the pledges of Dr. Wolfila's Patreon supporters, and I'd like to give a very special thanks to the kind folks pledged to Doc's shout-out tier. All the support on Patreon means a lot to me, and it helps my master's dark influence continue to grow. If you liked this video, like it, and if you loved it, click the subscribe and bell buttons for more videos. Be sure to also keep in touch by following me on social media at Instagram and Twitter at the Gulag. While I still have your attention, consider pledging to my master Dr. Wolfila's Patreon to support the channel and get bonus content like previews, VIP Discord server access, private movie night streams, and credits in videos. Consider pledging at patreon.com slash drwolfila. Also, check out official Goulash t-shirts and other merch on tpublic.com slash user slash Dr. Wolfula. Thanks for watching. See you all next time. You f***ing weirdos.